Welcome everybody to UFO Man Live. My name is Tim or UFO Man. My co-host, as you all know, is Tom Reed from the famous Berkshire UFO sighting. Tonight we have two guests. One is Toby from the Roswell Daily Record. Welcome, Toby. And the other one is our main guest, Tony Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Sorry, I got it right. Got um, it. <laughs> who's going to talk to us about his... Um, he's an experiencer, he's an author, and he uh, was part of the Secret Space Program and other uh, bad things that happened to him on Earth before he got there. So uh, we're going to cover a lot of very interesting topics. But before we do that, we have a word from our sponsor. Tom. I made that for Tom because Tom is the sponsor. He is UFO Expo, and Toby is also part of UFO Expo because he and the Daily Record are working with Tom to put this event on. So if you're interested in UFO Expo, please go to ufoexpo.com and get your tickets now because they're 40% off. Correct, Tom? Yeah, pretty close to it. Yeah, from 79 from 120. So, yeah, it's only till the end of the, the month. And then uh, there's going to be, a, it's going to go up to, I think, 99 to 119. But yeah, Toby's been great, man. He's been uh, staying close in contact with me, helping me out immensely. And, and uh, yeah, I just want to thank the record um, as a whole. I mean, they've been super supportive and and, uh, and have been for a long time, you know. But one of the things I wanted to, um, Toby just showed me something a minute ago or before we went live. And I thought it was freaking awesome because I didn't really know they had all these old, uh, you know, archives and the old machine typewriters and that sort of thing that were around in the 40s that actually worked on articles. Probably one of them anyway, worked on that story about the 1947 UFO crash. Correct, Toby? Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you a funny anecdote, too, while I'm here. Um, if you take a look, let me show you guys the inside news. The, down here. Inside the Roswell Daily Record right now. Make sure camera. you turn your camera sideways, too. You got it. Oh. I have one of those. That's the fan that came out of the UFO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Let's see how many... So, the audience agree with right that? Behind my desk, there's a microfish machine. Uh, oh, neat. We have film that dates all the way back to 1897. So, uh, wow. A friend of mine, Daniel Allen Jones... Back how far? 1897. Wow. So I'm actually so going to be searching through that for a film on the uh, or newspaper articles on the Aurora, Texas crash. Alien Fest. Yeah, here's just some fun, you know, posters we've kept from over the years. Very so cool. This, this is the, oh, okay. That's okay. That's the main room where all your journalists and editors sit. Yeah, so here's something funny. This desk right here yeah, actually came from the Air Force Base when they shut it down. They sold off a bunch of the furniture, and the newspaper acquired some of it. So. Cool. And that was the same Air Force Base that was involved in a 1947 crash then? Yes, that is correct. Cool. Wow. So, so, for, so those... Tuning in, this is the inside the Roswell Daily Record in the same building, correct? You've never moved, and it's still owned by the same family, correct? Well, the building, this isn't the building we were in at the time that happened. That building actually burned down in Ooh, okay. the late 1960s, I believe. Okay. But is a it, lot of the contents inside was saved, and that's a lot of the stuff you're seeing as we're walking around here. Okay. So. You got the famous front page articles from the crash. Gotcha. Um, here's some wow. of the pictures. Here's, here's what the press looked like back then. Wow, the very 40s. cool. 
yeah, a lot different than what we have now. These are all the all teletype. the placement type. Yeah, teletype. Um, just a lot of cool. Got some merch right there. <laughs> if you look in this cabinet, you can actually see where they would pick the different fonts that they use. Wow. And put them into the like a typewriter type of thing or press to type with. No, they would actually lay them down on a, lay on a down flat, flat. Oh, the plate. Yep. Yep. Oh my God. Okay. So that's, Last time that's what they would. That's oh, I can imagine they had to do it all by hand back then. You know, everything's all digitized now, so it's super easy. So that's the building. Have, top? Was that the building, Toby, up top? Yep, that was the one. It was on. Uh, I uh, can't remember the exact. I think it was Main Street. So the one on the uh, left? Fourth the Street, Fourth right? and Main. As we look, okay, there's the front, okay. So here's some old, uh, some archives not in the best of shape. <laughs> uh, more fonts, and then over here we have the typewriters you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, Tom, um, you might recognize this guy. So that's where the record's heart is. Interesting. God, those are old. What is that? Teletype sitter. Old typewriter. This is really cool. I appreciate you taking time to give everybody an inside look at the Roswell Daily Record. I mean, as of today, of this is super my pleasure. Cool. And actually, if you guys want to, um, the press we have is a Goss Urbanite. <coughs> it's from 1965. And the guys actually just fired it up. So if you sure. want to, I can take Maybe a walk back us. there. Yeah, for sure. So I don't know if you want me to Maybe you want me to mute my microphone because it's pretty loud, or have everybody turned down there? No, we we'll just warn people to turn down their volume a little bit because we're going to go into the press room. So if you've got your volume on high on your computer, please turn it down just a bit if it's too loud for you. There's the old record building right there. Okay. Very cool. All right. Love history. Take a look this way. Uh, yeah, I actually. Oh, there's somebody in my car. Class. Okay. Yeah, we got a guy working over here. It's a little late, isn't it? We actually started a podcast for the Roswell Daily Record that I know you two are going to come on to. It's called the Roswell UFO Symposium. I'll throw the link okay. uh, in the chat. Go for it. Oh, here's another cool thing. Oh, the movie. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's autographed. Let's see if we can read what it says. Oh, let me see. No, kind of hard with the glare. Kind of faded, but it's the producer. That was the original one with Martin Sheen, correct? Yep. Okay. Mac Machine's looking empty, guys. Oh, my God. You got to stop that thing. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Loud sound warning. Oh, how many copies are you putting out? I think we're froze up there a little bit. Yeah. I'd like to know what tomorrow's headline story is going to be ahead of time. <laughs> there he is. Cross signal there for a minute. Hmm. 
this is a very rare look inside the Roswell Daily right? That's live, too. Yep. That's really cool of to do that. Yes. Yeah, it's too many. The, the concrete walls are thick. It's freezing up. Right. You want to? Can you go to all? Yeah, there you go. So, hey, there he is. <laughs> okay, I can hear it again now. <laughs> yeah, we were, uh, we were. I was going to ask you what. Uh, it froze up a couple times, but what? Uh, what's tomorrow's headline story? What's the top fold? You know. Toby on UFO man. Yeah. With Tony Rodriguez. <laughs> oh, there he is. That's an impressive setup. Yeah, Not bad, right. I yep. heard show too, Tony. Some heavy lumber. Those guys are moving. Yep. Hey, to hey uh, Toby, can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. That's the top headline right there, Tom. For tomorrow's paper, city yep. manager. Oh, city oh, manager. Oh, right. That's uh, Joe, right? Yep. Oh my God! Yeah. Yep. Hot son of a gun. Oh my God! I heard about that, as you know. Yeah. But, Should uh, I? Uh, no. I guess we. I guess we can't mention anything. No. But, uh, so, wow. anyways, very awesome, yeah. Toby. Thank you very much for showing us the record. Yeah. Change my camera real quick, and I'll chat with you guys for a minute. Then I'll let you get to it. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you very much for coming on with such short notice. Really appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. I mean, Tom, Tom's my buddy. You are too. You guys need anything, just let me know. Um, we'll let you know. So That's what we're doing. Like I said, my podcast that you guys are going to appear on is called the Roswell UFO Symposium. Yeah. It's sponsored by the Roswell Daily Record. Um after I get off here, I'll put the link in the chat. Okay. Uh, UFO Expo in March, the event that we're doing is going to be huge. Um, film festival, there's going to be food, there's going to be music, there's going to be speakers, there's going to be cosplay. There's going to be Tom got, Reed. Uh, the bar is open till 1 a.m., so we're going to have a, a mixer tents outside. I think if things pan out, we're actually going to be showing films on the sides of of the buildings and we're going to have uh, barbecue ribs and smokers and everything. It's going to be a, we're bringing in a band from Albuquerque. So, um, and we'll just be right down the street from UFO McDonald's. If we get really bored. Yeah. We can always go there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, you know, child, um, kids meal. <laughs> documentary that I'm going to be on and Tom's going to be filming for this weekend called the experiencers from my buddy mind escape podcast. That's going to premiere there. So, Mm -hmm. We'll have the cast and the directors. That'll be fun. Uh, James Fox is going to be there. Moment of Contact. Caroline Corey's appearing virtually. Uh, it, it's a just a packed people, lineup. Yeah. And the value for the tickets, I mean, I would get the early bird now because as far as I know, those are gone at the end of the month. It's $79 for all that. It, right. It's going to be a great time. Three it's days. Be a great time. Three days and multiple things happening at once. So. If you want to be part of the film fest, that's going to be going at the same time. We have tracks and speakers, a Zoom guest. I mean, we've got pretty much every, oh, you know, everybody uh, who's anybody one, is going to be there. And, and, uh, one, one thing you forgot to mention, Tom. There's what? going what to be our raffle for yes, the raffle. Yes, the guitar. The guitar. All right. The guitar is signed by multiple u ufologists of noteworthy standard. Okay. Yep. Um, too bad Tony wasn't there. He could have signed it, but he's gonna anyways, sign. It. <laughs> yeah, and then um, uh, it's gonna be raffled off. So uh, you gotta come down there. You know I was uh, raffling it off. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Tell him. You tell him. You tell him first. I, I just <laughs> did. It's your turn. All right. It's gonna. Somebody it's, tell him. Somebody tell him. Yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's actually, uh, the guitar came from the, the, the uh, one of the guitars from the family of Steve Ray Vaughn. It was actually Jimmy Vaughn's guitar at one point. It was the one that was given to him to play on stage from a, like a knockoff company. And uh, never really played it. It's red. It looked fantastic. And so um, Josh Knight, who is one of my managers, who's related to uh, Tyrone Vaughn and, and Jimmy as well, um, was able to get it for me and brought it to Roswell. At, at the uh, in July when we had when Roswell had the fest, 
and uh, just basically ran around had everybody, you know, sign it. And so he's going to zoom in on Saturday night and raffle off this guitar that used to be owned by his family. Pretty cool. Yeah, actually, actually yeah. I walked right by you while you were getting Ben and Caroline and Melissa to sign it. Yeah, in the entrance area. So we, we almost bumped into each other. Cause that was at the event that the newspaper does. But yeah, Tom Reed was everywhere. Everybody was following him around town. There goes the limo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Sure, I got the limo. Yeah. So, if I, uh, if I, if all right. Well, guys. I, if, yeah. If I can get there, I'll be there. But I. Yeah. I don't yes, know definitely. If not, yeah. we're live broadcasting from there with you. We'll make sure you're a part of it, one way or another. Yeah, right. Toby's part of it. He's gonna have a setup there, and I think you're gonna be broadcasting, right? Your what's your name of your podcast again, so people know? The Roswell UFO Symposium. Okay. And I'll I'll drop the YouTube link in the channel. We're gonna be interviewing. Daniel Allen Jones tomorrow night. He's he's a researcher. He's a writer. He's he's super interesting. But uh, guess what? I We're interviewing to... Tony tonight. Hey, poor Tony. I came on here and just started running my mouth, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Making it easy. You know on it me. Once you get going, it's hard to stop. Yeah, I know, right? That's so why I get on a phone call. I'm like two hours later. Toby's like, you know, I'm like, I'm on. I feel like I'm on a podcast every time I make a phone call. So, <laughs> right? You we'll know. Do it on screen. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you. Shout out to my co-host Shane Frakes and Mike, Mike Escape and Mind Escape, and I'll talk to you guys later. Okay. Thanks for having me on. You got it, man. Thank you no so problem, much. No problem, man. Thank All you. Bye, bye. Bye, man. Bye, bye. And that was okay. rare. Okay. That was very interesting. But I gotta say, welcome, Tony. Um, let's get into your story. First, okay. I just want to say, sorry I uh, dragged my feet and you guys got a little nervous if I wasn't going to show. And so you had him uh, on and we got a good tour there. So sorry a lot about that. Nervous, maybe. A lot I wouldn't have missed you for the world, but it's just I, I did a couple other shows today and I was taking a break and the time got away from me. So sorry I was late. No, you were gotcha. yeah, not just a problem. 11th hour, that's all you made it. <laughs> so. The fact that you're here is what counts. Yeah, exactly. Okay. What I would like to do is dig deep into your story because a lot of people in our chat room most likely don't know your story. So what I would like to do is start from the very beginning when you had your first experience as an as a alien abduction and how you got dragged into um, sort of the training program before you left Earth for Solar, Solar Warden. Well, it wasn't Solar Warden that I was in. And actually, I was traded from through several programs. Um, okay. When I was a kid, I went to school. I was in a what's called the, the, the TAG program. Oh, there, I'm a full screen. I don't even like to look at myself. A um, little flickery. And I went to school with a kid that uh, was also in the program that we didn't get along. And he identified himself. He said, my dad's an Illuminati. What's your dad do? And I didn't know what that meant. And his dad came in and was the judge of the science fair that year. And he pointed me out to him and said, Dad, that's that boy I told you about. And the following night, I was abducted. I had, um, you know, like an ETs in my room, grab me and abduct me. So um, I was taken into what's called a career return program or a 20 and back program, what people kind of refer to it. And they took me basically for 20 years. They took me on a Thursday night and I lived for 20 years in the program, several different programs where I was slave labor and sold from program to program the first six years or so on earth through uh, privately owned. And then the, uh, the remainder, I was sold off into the military in the secret space program, which there is a huge infrastructure of uh, space assets in throughout the solar system and actually colonies throughout our solar system already established. Uh, that's been going on for quite some time. Um, how long would you say that it's been going on? A very long time. So at least uh, after right around the World War II era, if not before. But um, when I ended, I eventually ended up for the most of my time, I worked on the, I, I was owned and was slave labor and worked on something called the Ceres Colony Corporation, which uh, Ceres is a dwarf planet in between Mars and the asteroid belt. Hey, you got a picture of it right there. Um, that's it. That was uh, home for me for about uh, 11 or 12 years. And uh, there it is. Yeah. And it was a shorter hop to Jupiter, depending on where the uh, where the opposition was. 
and we would drive to there are major bases uh and space stations around jupiter where extraterrestrials do a lot of trading and uh you know actually it's like the capital of our solar system is around there and we would fly back and forth um and make contact with other species and other solar system in other star systems and then do trade missions we were trading goods for tech or tech for tech they were the the name of the game was to advance technology for all all of the colonies they were all after that so i worked on ships um i was ship maintenance for about maybe eight years on a smaller ship on an antiquated ship that was decommissioned and then i was promoted to cargo engineer on a modern ship in the last uh three years or so two and a half years of my time up there and then i was put back I woke up the next morning back in 1982 in my 10 year old body. <clears throat> I had the experience of being gone. I had the, the, you know, the disassociation of being gone for a long period of time so much that it felt foreign to be home again, but I didn't have the memories. And in 2015, I had an MRI scan and other things happened. I discovered the, the existence of the program and then the memories came flooding back and I, uh, Fortunately, I, you know, one way or the other to put it, it's fortunately because I was on Earth in the early days, there were places that I lived that I can prove that I never was in my life, that I've never been. So Seattle's one of them. And so I was able to go back there and I had knowledge of my way around somewhere that I'd never been. And so it was a it was a, um, you know, a feather in the hat of proof that let researchers keep working with me and and really gives me the courage to talk about it because it's hard to talk about. I mean, you know, right. Tom, I'm sure your story is it's hard to go because, you, you know, people are going to want to dissect every little bit of it. And so I would never speak about it publicly if I didn't have, a you know, a, 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 stand, a, a fair amount of proof that supported me. So uh, fortunately, I did have the time on Earth and other things checked out for me, even in space that uh, stand by my account. And nowadays, after recent um, recent live talks that I've done, there's overlapping proof. Other people are coming forward with their own things, with their own circle uh, accounts of serving in programs and proof is overlapping. They're saying things that, that I knew that I said that they didn't know or things that, you know, there's overlap. So this is a rea the reality is that um, we are very advanced. The humans, uh, the, our governments and other foreign governments, namely the Germans and their Asian programs, are very advanced and they're they have a foothold in space already throughout our solar system and nearby stars with colonies and this is this is the truth this is one of the things they're not telling us would that be the others. uh Nach Waffen? so i remember it as middenacht so midnight uh zero hour they was really the, was, they had a lot of names for it that it's kind of keeps it secret so they could tell a, a, they could do business with somebody and identify themselves and then take advantage of the deal and go away and then they had a different name they used like an alias so they had many names but i remember it zero hour and that referred to the ability to travel time every every it's always zero hour midnight it's always midnight they're the the, the midnight fleet uh or the dark fleet yeah okay yeah it's right so they're yeah right different versions of the translate it loses something in translation yeah. um does that justify the fact that back in, uh, say, 1942, 1943, when the Germans moved a lot of their technology, that they had the ability to escape our Earth's gravity and go out into space? So that was, um, you know, I don't know a lot of the history, per se, verbatim. Like, it wasn't taught to me. It's just kind of hearsay what I heard, water, you know. But um, my understanding from when I was on Ceres Colony was that World War One was about money and resources and World War Two was about interstellar flight, that they had discovered it and the other governments wanted in and World War Two broke out and they were emboldened by treaties they made with with ETs. And so that kind of led to the great to the offensive action in the World War Two um, from the Axis powers. Um, I do know that. Um... I read an article once or a document that, that said that uh, around the time that they were, uh, the Axis powers were actually um, gathering up left uh, technology from the Germans after World War II, one of the things they found was a burnt out shell of an interstellar, what appeared to be a cylinder vehicle. Mm -hmm. So they were working on it. Mm -hmm. So um, I've actually seen footage from 19, 
26 of a Hanabu test flight. So on series colony, I would say for this, you know, as an eyewitness that a lot of the architecture was from that time period. So there were a lot of marble steps and columns and the architecture was like, you know, 1940s, 1930s Europe. That was a lot of the architecture and buildings. They had gone into hollow caverns and began to build cities to, you know, and the, the architecture was older and there was a lot, there was rust and there were a lot of, you know, de, uh, erosion on the infrastructure. So it was an older, the colony had uh, construction that was older and had been aging. Uh, it wasn't brand new. So I visited Mars Colony as well. And that was a lot newer. The architecture there was much newer and in much new, you know, newer condition. When I got to the series colony, it seemed much older than the Mars Colony. So the Mars colonies, um, how many are on Mars at this time? Do you know? So Randy Kramer said that he worked with somebody, uh, you know, I'm in contact with him. And uh, he said that they're as they estimated 10 and a half million people on Mars uh, break away. Wow. So what I saw when I was there, I was in a small forward base uh, for, for a short time in an experimental combat program that got canceled when it failed. And then I was moved to a city and the city was all underground, big domes that were underground that had big open areas and then had hall networks of hallways. It looked more like a very advanced, like a shopping mall. But there were thousands of people that I witnessed there that were civilian and military. So there was a pretty big population. It was easily as densely populated as, um, you know, in any inner city, downtown city district of any major city. So it was a, there were there were quite a bit of people there that I witnessed. I actually saw a picture that I grabbed, even though you described the uh, dome as being underground and only letting in a little bit of sunlight, I found this picture. Right. Basically that, but underground and then the very top of the dome, you could see the wind blowing dirt around and there was sunlight coming in. So not that big with giant buildings in there, picture smaller domes, maybe the size of a you know, a gymnasium, two, two gymnasium size domes. Okay. And, yeah. And then buildings that were built off of the dome that were connected by hallways. And I didn't really travel very far from the original, from the hangar that I went until I was eventually um, transported off into to the series colony. I went to a, a train station that took me there via portal. Okay. So, One thing I was going to say is. Tom and I were talking about this before you came on, and we were discussing the temperatures on the surface of Mars during the day and at night. It would almost seem uh, too inhospitable for people to be on the surface. So most of the, the activity was always underground, correct? That's right. Well, during the day in certain areas of Mars, it gets up to 70 degrees. It's just at night, it gets very cold. So there are areas where we were during the daytime, we did conduct missions on the surface and it was cold it was like being at high altitude or the top of a mountain but it wasn't completely unbearable we were aware that if we were caught out at night that it was unsur not survivable that it was very cold and we i the environmental suit that i had the soldiers had a different suit that they could operate at night but the suits that, that we were equipped with were, were inadequate for the nighttime cold but during the day there are places like? at the equator what, what did the suit look like mine yeah, it was a very it was literally the most comfortable thing I've ever worn. So yeah. I don't know what material it was it was made out of, but it was extremely comfortable and nothing like anything that I've worn what, what did before it look or like? since. But it was bright white. Uh, bright it looked white. like a it looked like a latex, like a rubbery suit that was white. And so we were highly visible on a battlefield. If you want to think that if you want to think about what we were there doing. And then it, it came up over us. We had a backpack. I had an arm readout, and we had a gun attached to our arm, to our right arm, a rail gun. And then uh, it had a cone, like a helmet that had a cone out that was open. I was breathing the air. We had we had been modified to be able to breathe the air. And then the suit did let out oxygen in the into the mask. It, it, it monitored us. So when we exerted ourselves, we would get boosts of of oxygen. You were breathing. You were actually breathing oxygen on the surface of Mars. Yes. Um, we were modified. So that somebody, I was in a MUFON show once and the guy was just like, no, 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 no. Mars only has 1% of Earth's atmosphere. 
but Mars is half the size. So if you cut a sphere in half and put one one percent of the atmosphere, it's actually quite a bit of atmosphere. And in fact, the Martian atmosphere is much taller than the atmosphere on Earth. It goes up uh, 120 miles or 160 miles or something before, uh, and then Earth is uh, 80 to 100 miles. I, you know, I'm off. I'm running these off the top of my head, but basically, yeah. I went and did the math. There's quite actually quite a bit of atmosphere on Mars, and I believe that there were surgeries that I went through before I was sent there that that modified it so that made it easier for us to breathe so the other question i have too is i've, I've seen a lot of uh talk about this as a recently over the last six months or so what would you say um when I, i've heard that there's all these different colonies there underground and so on and so forth do you do you believe that there's all these different colonies or is it all like connected or and someone had asked you know someone had said actually that there were shopping centers and everything else under the surface of Mars and you could eat regular meals. I mean, can you shed any light on that? That's exactly what it was like. It was very comfortable. They were underground. They were very Mars. So unlike Ceres colony, which was also underground, but had tend to have tighter spaces and had natural caverns that had bigger areas on Ceres colony, but still was a smaller area. But Mars, like I said, had had a very flowing architecture. So instead of being in a straight Spartan concrete hallway, when you're going from A to B, it had like a curve and it had decorative ceiling, you know, like custom custom concrete work uh, that had a reddish tone to it. And uh, the carpet, there was carpet, there was water. Um, it was very advanced. Now, I had an apartment. I had, it was the only time that I had a com very comfortable room out of the whole time to myself. I had my own bathroom and uh, it was comfortable. So the the Mars colony, the from what I saw of it, both both places, even the forward base, Looked more like uh, uh, if you've seen what modern schools are like, you know, there's a, in the town I'm in, they built a new middle school. It's amazing. The architecture is great. And that's about the, on par with what the forward base that I was in was built like. It had, you know, the the floor, you know, a concrete floor that would go down in a ramp to a level and no steps. It would just graze down and then up and big, so wide very, hallway. very livable. It was very comfortable. So I get up in the morning. I, I run to the kitchen for a Folgers and vanilla cream. So. I mean, what, is there actually like you wake up? Do you actually like go to breakfast? I mean, what what was your yeah. day? Like? So in the forward base, we had a cafeteria on the bottom level. Uh, so we met at a cafeteria and there was a buffet style, like a military buffet style that we ate and they served food. And when I was on uh, moved to the bigger city, I had food delivered to my door. I wasn't allowed to I wasn't allowed to freely roam. So when I woke up, there was food waiting in my room. There was also the technology to make us go to sleep. It was a box in the room. And I would there was an alarm that would tell me I had two minutes to get in bed. And then you went to sleep. And then I woke up. And so they, I assume there were people coming in the room and cleaning up the mess. And, you know, I was getting turned down service while I was asleep. Um, but they, and I tried to fight it several times. And a couple of times woke up uncomfortably on the floor because... I didn't go to bed when it went off and you know when it happened you immediately went to sleep and then uh, it, the same effect it would wake you up in the morning i woke up so wherever you were off. you just that's where you slept then you drop you would drop right there and go to sleep that's right so we on mars first or series first mars first so it was in between so the the program on mars for mars colony corporation was a combat program they were trying to they had the soldiers were groomed for it and trained for a very long time. They had they had an entire their suit looked way different. It was metal, looked more like an Iron Man suit, but camouflaged. And it was very advanced. And they were they were negative buoyancy, so they could run and jump. They had, the suit weighed them down enough to where they could walk freely, the same way we do on Earth. The suit that I was in was lighter, so it was hard. You couldn't run. You you would start hopping. The gravity was hard to get along, um, but the the soldiers had negative buoyancy or equal par. I don't know the I'm a, I could be getting the term wrong, but basically, they could run just like we we run now. Um, they were they were weighted down, um, but they were expensive, and the insectoids that we were dealing with could had more numbers. So they were trying to get they were trying to put soldiers minimally trained, minimally equipped on the battlefield for strategic reasons and. We were the first version of that. I was in the first version of that. And what they found was that the insectoids adapted very quickly, much quicker than they, they had a scale that they expected them to adapt to the, to the strategies. And they adapted much quicker off the scale. So they canceled the program and 
As a result, we sat around about a dozen guys. We sat with nothing to do for weeks. And then they shipped us to the city. And uh, I, had, I was given aptitude tests and then uh, got uh, skilled labor, skilled skilled uh, labor, if I'm saying that right, and was trained for ship, ship maintenance. Basically, I was returned wrenches for the next eight years on a submarine, on a converted submarine that was uh, belonged to the Ceres Colony Corp. So I was shipped off to Ceres Colony, and they were very Nazi-like, very, very Third Reichish uh, of a culture, and uh, worked on a ship. And I was there as a slave. I didn't have any really um, free run of the place until I got promoted, and I was a cargo engineer. I started getting a bit of a paycheck. Hey Tony, was that um, uh, submarine something like this? Uh, well, you know, I never got a good look on the outside of it, but I would have to say no. Um, <coughs> The, the tanks on the side of it may be, it did have large tanks that were added. We were aware that there were large tanks added to the outside of it. But it was, and, and now that I look at the layout, so other people have kind of sent me um, schematics of certain um, submarines from the era, from the 50s. Right. And, what, and from what I can tell, I think that... Um, I think that they took two of them and stuck them together. I think there were two submarines that were kind of welded together and they had tanks around the outside. There were radioactive um, chemical, radioactive tank. There were tanks with radioactive fluid that had to purge that were a part of the process. We were aware to get out of the room when those purged and happened. And there were other really highly cor corrosive fluids, acids or, you know, probably things that ran like a battery and uh the tanks that were always moving fluid throughout it and it was highly corrosive so yeah i actually read uh somewhere that they were using the old um um attack subs and putting um any gravity generators on the outside of the subs because they are already sealed with oxygen and the, the ability to create water with inside the canisters so that's why they could go into space hmm. so everybody's like tony build a build a motor man you know like you worked on it for that long um it really wasn't like that you know the same way that um if you're driving somewhere and you map it on your on your map and you don't pay attention and then you get there and you still have no idea where you're at you can't read right read. so the the systems were set up like that for us like i reported to a screen in the morning that identified me with my number and said go go to the tool crib and pull out this this and this and return and I would go and grab the tools and it would go to this section and disconnect this and return. And it would have right. the instructions throughout the day. That was that was my that was my job. That's exactly what I did. We had so, welders, we had cutters, um, we had all kinds of battery powered tools that all so had to go back. So your supervisor or person who gave your instructions for the day, if you will, who was that? It was a computer screen. They were we were locked in. There were three of us in the lower part decks of the ship. That were reported and we were all we had we had collars we had shot collars and we would be disciplined we were slave labor and the the crew of the ship was in an upper deck so very rarely did we get officers or visits from of, of the you the work with other other humans yes and we were all equally the same they so we would report to the screen and it would send us off to our tasks in different areas of the ship to make a we friend there to make a friend there i didn't really get along with those guys for most of the time um yeah, it was a very that time that service on that ship was very kind of lonely and because i was flight and i i lived in a barracks with people that were mine that were that were working in my, most of the people that were in the barracks that i was at worked in the mines and because i was flight and i didn't come back dirty they they really didn't care for me and i so i didn't i did eventually make friends i did eventually have relationships over time i mean everybody does no matter where you work and uh, I did, but it wasn't it wasn't like that in the beginning. I was just wondering because if this happened to you and a lot, a lot of a lot of other people were involved in that, and you're going public, you know, wouldn't it be amazing that somebody who was there just reaches out and says, "Hey, by the way, you know, you know that kind of thing." You know, so I've had probably six people that I met while I was up there um, go public, yeah, or not not go public, but contact me. A couple of people have been public. There's been a lot of overlap. There's a few interviews that are coming out. Jean-Charles Moyen is somebody yep. that um, identifies me from up there. Uh, another guy, um, Johan Fritz, Jody uh, uh, Will Nutter, 
um, has overlap of series. Now, we didn't meet each other, but he describes the hangar bay and an incident that happened, at, and I described the hangar bay the exact same way. So we had overlap in our testimonies. I do um, know people I say thought, that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was no, just saying, you know, part of the Berkshire's UFO thing, I have people say all the time, I was part of that, I was, but I hold a lot of things back. And then somebody will say something, and I'm like, wow, you know? That's right. That's yeah, exactly exactly. right. And so that's how you know each other. When it's rare nowadays. So many people have come forward with information. It's very saturated now. Um, so it's hard to, for people to bring new new information to identify themselves as legitimate. It just is. It's just, you right. know. Um, I thought more people would come forward. To be honest, I thought when I I thought when I did my first interviews and pre presented my case and how things panned out and why I'm talking about it, I thought that a hundred other people would come out and do the same thing, and then I would just kind of get go to the wayside. But what happened was, uh, you know, I'm one of the only ones that has a lot of the memories. A lot of people have really fragmented. They get memories, but but they're so fragmented that they can't. It's not enough to really go on a show. And then hold up to scrutiny of being cross-examined. You know, you have they, to have quite a bit. They become disassociative, right? That's right. And well, and we're talking about really in when we're we're uh, when you really look at the core of it, we're talking about industrial grade, highly advanced mind control of wiping memory. So we're talking about alien, you know, possibly from thousands of years in the future, worth of memory wiping te technology. And so for whatever reason, there's the Farsight Institute confirmed my story and they have their story about why I remember I got an MRI scan. Michael Rell from the Mars Records got an MRI scan the same time frame before he got his memories back. Same as me. Um, I wanted to remember. That's the other thing. And there was a lot of people up there that did not. They had no desire to remember. There were people that were slaves up there that I knew that said that told me flat out, I don't want to remember this. I hope they I hope they give me a double shot. Of what of the cocktail that makes you forget because i have no intention of remembering for the most part even people that were free that had a better job than me that weren't slaves still had a pretty traumatic and miserable existence i mean the space travel was very breathtaking and beautiful but it was those moments were few and far between the rest of it you were in a military job and you were not treated well and most of the co colonies have this it's the same mo and when you talk to a lot of people that have been very credible that have come forward uh jason rice kevin trimble Randy Kramer. You talk to a lot of those people that their, their account of their time up there is saturated with trauma. And so a lot of people just have no desire. And there have been a lot of people that contacted me and said, Tony, I, you're exactly right. And what you're saying is right. And, and I say, well, why don't you tell somebody about it? Come on, let's, let's talk. And they're like, nope, I have no desire. And in the case of Jason Rice, and it's really unfair for me to use his name without his permission, but in the case of Jason Rice, it costs his, it costs him a great deal in his personal life. It cost his family a great deal. And he had to step away and change all his numbers. Michael Gerloff, same thing. There is a huge price to pay. My children get ridiculed at school because the other kids at school see my interviews on YouTube. Yeah. And I so, guess. you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I'm not unscathed by the craziness of, of this all. So I just, once I started, it was too late for me to stop. You know, yeah. when people ask me, I tell the story. You can't that's jump in with one foot, right? So that's right. I'm already, I'm already hitting way, yeah. in, way in over my head here. So let me ask you this: When you went from Mars to Cirrus, right? How did you go? How did they? How was that? It was a train. What? It was a train. So wait, one day, a soldier, instead of going to the school, Brent Elliott. So they on Ceres Colony, they had giant machines the size of houses. They had dozens of them throughout the colony that spit out atmosphere and they were not worried about it. They could turn inert inert chemicals into atmosphere or water into atmosphere. So it was not a problem. In fact, there were times when the hangar bay doors at the other end, we're talking 19 kilometers of hangar that opened to vacuum with an airlock at the end, a thousand feet wide, thousands of feet wide and 1,500, 2,000 feet tall. The doors would get stuck open and let air vent out to space. And they had enough capacity to offset that for days before the hangar bay lost air. So we could still walk around. It was light air. There was hypoxia. You know, you would be lightheaded, like in a high altitude. But they had the ability to create atmosphere. I wish. I, I brought home a fear of tight spaces, claustrophobia, and breathtaking emotional problems. And wrenches. <laughs> uh, and... Um, so how did you get the train thing? How, I'm sorry. Back. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah. I started interrupting. The, I, you no, know, it's okay. I'm just, questions. Yeah. 
Brent, I don't know. I wasn't there when they did it. So they hollowed out areas and they would build things. They had construction crews and they would remodel things very quickly. Um, one day I was escorted to a train station and we got on the train and there were civilians. And um, the train had the the same, you know, the uh, the roller coaster that has the bar that comes down over your lap. Yeah. yeah. We sat facing forward and the other trains that I were on faced center. But this one we faced forward. It was a very mod, very beefy seats, you know, like quality. And um, the train lifted off a couple inches and went into a tunnel. And there was a poof, like a disorienting, like a static shock, like static electricity, poof. And disoriented, like, like a camera flash went off. And it immediately started slowing down. And then when it got slow enough, it went down on tracks and actually rolled in. And when I got off the train, I was on series column. So it was a... It was a portal in a tunnel that moved this train system and probably to not only just between Mars and Ceres, but to many other places. Uh, this, is, this is a portal system that's based on trains. I, you know, you got to think about it. Portals are all about going at the same speed, the correct speed and the correct entryway into a portal. What determined where you would go, where you would end up at. So a train would be a good way to have a consistent entry and speed into an in artificial portal, you know, a wormhole, Einstein Rosenbridge. So a train would be ideal for that. And that's exactly what it, what I remember. So that was the only time I rode on that as well. So this train was a maglev, right? It, yes. You could feel it. You could feel it hop up and no, like when it roll, it would roll out and then lift off and go. And so it did roll and you could hear it rolling and then it would be able to, you know, lift it. You could feel it kind of pop up and then it would be silent. And well, with, you could see the, the, structure flying by you know like braces inside the tunnel you can see those flying by but um then there was a poof it, the whole ride was less than 10 10 minutes once it began once it started moving it was less than 10 minutes from start to finish and i was on series and when i got off i would the dirt was different the construction was like i said the architecture was much different it was older and it said there was an intercom when i got to the when i got from the forward base to the city on mars when I got off the transport and walked out into the dome, it said, welcome to Mars Colony Corp, the most advanced colony in the solar system. And it gave a date or whatever. It's like, welcome. And then when I got on the train and I got to Ceres Colony, when I walked out on the train into a big, it was a hangar area. The train dropped you off in like a hangar area. And it said, welcome to the Ceres Colony Corporation, the most advanced colony in the solar system. It said the same damn thing. So they were all in um, you know, competition with each other for technology. All the colonies. Okay. So, the one thing I wanted to ask you is how did you get to Mars in the first place? Right. So Mars, we flew there. So um, in the early days, when I was very started working with researchers and they asked me this question, it said, how long was the flight? So I was on the moon. I was trained. I went through a round of surgeries when I was on the moon. They took me. I was sold from Seattle and drugged in a parking lot into a van and i woke up on a craft on its way to the moon about 30 minutes from a base uh the trapezoid base on the back of the moon and from the at that point i was put through surgeries several surgeries uh, very painful process processes with ets with tall grace and then they loaded us and we went to another base on the moon we flew on a small transport to another base and they they did an operational test they test. They did a combat test of us, and then we stayed the night in a hospital, uh, like a hospital gurney, you know, like in a cot. And then the next morning, they took us to a hangar, and it was a much larger ship. And I was asked how long was the flight. I kept, and I said, "Man, I can't remember. I can't remember how long the flight was. It seemed like it was instant, maybe a half hour, hour. I don't." And that was weird because it was a gap in the memory that I couldn't remember. But then. Recently, there's somebody called JP that's come forward that's worked with Dr. Sala. And he said that they put you to sleep on the flight, that as soon as it took off, and I went, oh, my God, that's what happened. So it was a much longer flight, but they made you sleep. And I remember we woke up when we were in orbit around Mars, and we were awaiting security. Uh, we were waiting airspace clearance to land. So we were in orbit around Mars for like two or three hours for a long time. It was three hours plus, and we just waited there. And the ship wasn't even full. There was probably... There wasn't a lot of people on the for the capacity of the ship. Uh, it, you know, fifty people in a in a room full of that could hold a hundred, uh, at least. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. I just have a question about Mars in regards to you being there. Did you ever 
come across the conventional um, uh, technology that was being used by NASA for Mars surveillance or Mars research? No, not 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 once. Uh, I will say this: the transport we took from the forward base to the city, Ares Prime, people call it. I, I think I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. Was Ares Prime? That transport had a blend of uh, like jets. It had wings, and it had a blend of uh, anti grav, and it, like it went very high and very fast. But it had uh, like like jets or rockets on it and wings, so you could you could hear it. It behaved more like a uh, it behaved more like a airplane. What's the length of the day where? On Mars. So that's a good question because I don't really remember off the top of my head what the length of the day was. We were underground and we were out. We did we did hiking missions and the first one was two hours that we were out and it was the morning. And then we, the other team would go the next day. And then I did an afternoon hike and then the other team would go a couple. So they were they were staggered two days apart. And then I did an evening hike. Um, so, I, you know, I never really looked that up. I mean, I suppose I got to look it up, but I don't. I, it, it wasn't a big deal to me because they just told me where to, when to be where I was. I, I was not, I did not have freedom to roam the entire time I was on Mars. I had somebody that told me where to be and when. So paying attention to the days was was ir totally irrelevant for me. So, okay. I went through several surgeries. I went through many surgeries. Um, I don't even remember them all, but I remember that they did commit, they did have surgery on me with no anesthetic. They opened me up, they opened my back up. They opened my head up and uh, with no anesthetic. And I would say them, plead to them. This is very, I think this is kind of important um, to point to make is that while they were doing this, I was in telepathic communication with them, with, with gray ETs. And I would ask them, how can you do this without any, giving me something for the pain? Why, why would you do this? And their answer was always the same. You're not going to remember it anyway. They said, you're not going to remember it anyway. So we're not even going to waste the time. You're just yeah, going to feel it. They would just suck it up, suck it up. This basically was their attitude. So um, that was something that motivated me. I said, I am going to remember this. And it motivated me. I, I want, like I said, when I went back at the end of my time up there, I wanted to remember. I wanted to prove them wrong. I, and I wanted to remember the people that I knew and the fact that I was in love with somebody. And I wanted to not forget what I, what from the point, from the point that I entered the space program to the point that I exited, I had gone, I had, gone a long way. I was very, in my eyes, very successful. And I'd gone come a long ways. And I didn't want to forget that. I felt like I had achieved, I was close to my freedom, earning my freedom. And it was a huge achievement for me. And I didn't want to forget. So I got a couple of questions for you because this is, uh, okay, so you weren't, were you in Seattle or when you said you were taken into a, I guess, a van? Yeah. Basically, one of the first stops, I was in Inyo Kern, and I went through a trauma-based mind control program, and then a remote viewing program, and then a blend of it, like a, like a, they were eventually putting us, giving us drugs and putting us near death, and we were chatting. What year was this? What year was in, that? In 82 and 83. 82. Oh, 82 to 83. So April of 82, and then when I got to Peru, my first station, then they took me to Seattle. I was there for about a week. Okay. And then I was flown to Peru. And when I got to Peru, it was right after the new year. It was so it was January of 83 when I was in Peru. And that's when you were taken off planet. No, I was in Peru for almost two years. And then I was shipped to Seattle and I was there for almost two years. Yeah. So yeah. I was about 16 uh, when I they they sold me to the military in Seattle. Okay. They were giving us drugs every morning. They were giving us pills to take every morning and they changed the pills and I was allergic to them. And so they said, you, you either got to take these or we're going to sell you to the military. Those are the verbatim, okay. the exact words. So when, when was your last day that you remember being on earth? Like the date of it? No, no. They, just, they didn't no, exactly your age, celebrate your age, my age. Like your age. They didn't exactly celebrate my birthday. So no, I know. your age. Something that was, uh, were you 16? The when? best I can guess is right around 15, 15, 15 16. 16. And then you were gone for 20 years. About well, this was in the 20 years. So then I was gone for about 12 years after that. Okay. So, you know, into space. So the whole, the entire time was 20 years. And the first six years or so, I was in on Earth. So when you came so, back, was it a time travel thing? Did you come back at a certain 
Well, there had to be a time travel component, exactly. So I woke up back in 1982, back in my original body. That's what I was trying to get I think there was cloning, and I think that they could put the clone back in time, and then they just killed it. And my consciousness went right back to my body a few minutes later, and then they put me back. I think that's the best guess. You know, like, I wasn't briefed on it. I was never privy to what was going on. They just kind of did it to me. It was like a time travel when you came back. What's that? It was almost like time travel when you went back. You became... So yeah, when I woke up the next morning, I woke up in my bed the next morning and I looked at my toys on the floor in my bedroom back in Michigan and I was totally lost. And I went, oh my God, I had the sensation of being gone for 20 years, but I did not have the memories. The memories had been successfully deleted, but I had this. I went to school that day. The next, I went to, got up and went to school that day. It was a Friday and I asked to raise my hand to use the bathroom. It's not a big school and I've been there my whole life. And the teacher said, sure, Tony, go ahead. And I said, where's the bathroom? Because I'd forgotten where it was. And the teacher called my mom that weekend and said that I had amnesia. I need to get checked out by the doctor. Something was wrong because everybody in class laughed. I legitimately could not remember where the bathroom in school was because I had that that sensation of time passing, you know. So right. um, that was, it was it was that. And when, also when I think about it, so when I think about back to being 11 years old, I'm 50 right now. Okay. So 11 years old is, uh, you know, what, 39 years ago. So that's what it feels like. But if I think back to nine years old, it feels like 70 years ago or 50, you know, 60 years ago. It's very hard for me to remember prior to 10 years old. It's an additional, that yeah. time frame is still there. Like that memory block. But in essence, there. you've lived, you're 62. That's right. Uh, 70. 72. Well, there's more. I'm still I'm still unpacking it, to be honest with you. There's still things I'm unpacking. I'm working on the second book. And then going public with the information, I've had to really structure it in a way that people could keep up. So I, you know, I can easily talk about details of this quickly and lose people. And when you talk about time travel, you lose most people anyway. I mean, Project really. Pegasus. Everybody believes in UFOs. Everybody knows there's ETs out there. Everybody knows we're being visited. But when you talk about time travel, you get That's the a stretch for people, yeah. You get the thousand yard stare. They go, "What? Twenty years, and you were when?" Where oh, were well, actually, parents? a Russian Where astronaut tra time traveled, went back a second in time. So well, I've heard more than that, but uh, Doctor Basiago went uh, back to the Gettysburg Address. Oh yes, yeah. So I've talked to him, Doctor Basiago, and he's the Project Pegasus was. Um, you know, legitimate. And I talked to him. So the other thing was that I uh, mentioned the 20 year increments to him. So when I, I asked, why not 50? When they were putting me through it in the very beginning, I was on the table. The very, the you know, moments after they abducted me and they said they wanted to borrow my consciousness was their exact words for 20 years. And I said, well, why not 50 years? Why not 10 years? Why 20? And he said that most species, he said species, not people. Most species, if they go more than that with this blend of technology, with this version of the technology, if they went more than 20, they would go. They had a high probability of being insane when they were put back. Yeah, I and, actually uh, saw that. It says it right here. At the end of 20 years, they have an option for another 20 years. The maximum number of 20 and backs are three because everyone experiences mental deterioration yes. during the third one. Interesting where you got that from. But I want to point this out that Dr. Uh, Andy Bashago said that the Project Pegasus was limited to 20 year increments as well. So when they went back in time, they could go back in increments of 20. They could go back 60 years, but not 55 years. They could go back 100 years, but not 90. They had to go in increments of 20. He said, when you look on rings of the trees, they're in 20 year groups that there's a there's a rhythm, an energetic rhythm of the of the world of the earth that locks the time travel, the technology is, is locked into those 20 year increments. So the, who, who'd have uh, thunk it? The technology for, I think it's the technology for uh, age regression was garnered from the Nordics in a deal with the Nordics. So, right. From what I, from what I remember, there's more than one way to do it. So there's the, and, and, I was told that it's one of the very first technologies that ET species will trade with a new species. So a species that gets into space, you know, that goes from the from not being in space to being a spacefaring. Of course, they come in contact with more advanced extraterrestrials. And the very first question is always, can you give us some technology? 
And the first thing they do is give them the 20 and back tech, the life extension technology. And, I, you know, if you really look at it, I, I, and this is the theory in my head, but it's kind of a test because we really haven't used it well since we've gotten it. They've used it. They've been, they've, if you look at Neera Isley, a friend of mine, if you look at her story, she was greatly abused. And my story is my story is the story of abuse with this. So it's you're talking about technology to take somebody for 20 years and then erase their memory and put them back. And it's a slippery slope. I mean, I got to think that I might not be, I would be after a while bored with it and be challenged to abuse it, to abuse it. And I think it's a, I think it's a IQ test that ETs will give a new species and say, here's this. And let's see how you, let's see how you guys handle this. And they kind of watch their behavior and see if they're ready for other things. And I think we resoundingly failed it uh, in the beginning. So maybe we're better now. I know that the, Marine, uh, that there are military programs that are using a, a more favorable way. And I know I've met several people in my life that remember everything that have gone, they served on Mars Colony Corp and they were back and they had all their memories and probably a paycheck. So there are people that go through and it's, they're treated, you know, fairly. And I think that I was my, in my case, I was just kind of snuck through the side door because they could, it was not because I wasn't groomed for it or ideal for it. They just took me and snuck me through because they could do it. And I was just some, another, you know, piece of equipment. Tom? No, I just, uh, you know, more questions about when you go back to school and when you try to regroup and when these thoughts start coming to you and you're talking to your family and you're starting to realize that this actually happened, you know, what, what it must have been like? So, I, sorry if this is a lag that happened here. Um, I didn't have a lot of memories, but uh, a few weeks later, I think I was abducted again, and I think it was a follow-up. There were there were guys in a van that pulled into my into my driveway and and took me. And I had the, I woke up in the night, almost running out the door, sleepwalking, and jumped in the back of a van and was whisked off. And that's all I remember. Um, my, I had a local. I was a small town. I lived in a small town in Michigan, and. Um, I had a local doctor in a small town that I went to. I had a practice. A practice. Now, I didn't go to, a, you know, and he was out of town one day. He like won a trip and the guy that filled in for him, they called it. They called my mom and kind of made me come in. And that day, other kids from my class and from my school were there as well that did not go to that doctor. They said, yeah, they called us and had us come in. And when I went in and saw the doctor, he was younger. He was a brain surgeon. And the entire he checked. He gave me the stethoscope stethoscope. And then he asked me what my dreams were. He kept asking me over and over again, what do you dream? Have you had any weird dreams lately? Tell me about your dreams. And I was freaked out and I just said no. But the, that was the, it was like a follow-up examination by the government. Right yeah, by the government. It was a follow-up. That happened after. And then my father, I think, went. I think they took my dad the same night and uh, because he had the genetics as well. And we never really got along again after that. And my dad used to say to me afterwards, for years after, like, you're different. I want my son back. He would say, I'd say I want my son back because you're you're nothing like you used to be. He said he would say that to me, you know, when I was 11. And uh, our our the whole family deviated. The whole course of our family life deviated after that day. Like, like it was just, it was family wide. Shattered. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Splintered. I I've that. actually uh, heard from other people that have come forward with your same story, pretty much. Uh, one of them was a lady named Penny. I, I don't recall her last name, but she was talking about how she had been tortured as a child before she went into the secret space program. And they fractured her mind to where they created bubbles in her mind. And then they program those bubbles with what they wanted to create altars. Did that happen to you? So, uh, yes, it was a version of that technology. So Penny Bradley is a friend of mine and a very, yeah, very dear is. person. And Penny's, Penny's account is kind of all over the place. So it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, it's nonlinear because she experienced so many things. So it's, it, it can be hard to, to keep up, but I, I feel Penny's been through some legitimate things and she's the real deal. Um, my in my case they were trying to get us to do a service a psychic service they were trying to get us to do a remote viewing of either the future or the past and they had a they had an outcome in mind so i didn't go through the fracturing like that i did go through versions of programming 
So they were giving us, gives me a headache when I think about it, but they were giving us uh, drugs and then hurting us. So we would be in a great deal of pain and then making us watch movies that had like strong subliminals. And they were movies that went from cartoons to animals being butchered to war scenes and then back to cartoons again. So it was like you get you got traumatized from it. And there was programming there. And that went on for months. That went on for months. And then they started to not let us sleep, sleep deprivation. They'd wake us up every 15 minutes all night and then make us stand at the bed, at the foot of the bed. Soldiers would come in and they'd slap us or shock us with a cattle prod. And then we could go back to sleep. And what that did was train us to go catatonic on command. If we got shocked, we immediately, for the rest of my time up there, if I got an electrical shock, I immediately disassociated and would await command. I would await commands. And so that was that was the the programming that I got, among other things. So it's kind of scary to me because I have to really acknowledge the fact that I went through that and that there may be things that I'm unaware of that I'm still programmed to do. So I don't own guns for that reason. Do you remember, do you remember what the craft looked like? Any of the crafts? Yeah, a bunch of them. Uh, so there is a video. I don't know the story. I was in a conference in San Jose, and there's a video of some guys... Uh, it was like a thumb drive that got hidden and you had to solve a math equation and then find it was a map and they had these videos and there was a like a uh one of the videos showed a, a top-down view of a craft i think or over jupiter or somewhere and it was exactly the profile of the ship uh, that i was on like i said the first one was a submarine i was on i threw i flew on more than one disc i flew on a disc back at the end of it i didn't take a train back i was on a disc and it was like a six-hour flight from series to the moon where, where the outside of it too or just the inside of it just outside the window and when i walked on the catwalk to get to it i could see it it was like a, a polished aluminum finish right. to it and uh it had it was your disc shape and it had a room on the top of it so it had a protrusion with windows around it and the room had couches on the inside and like it was grimy it was old it was you know if you ride a, like a public bus where it's sticky yeah. grimy it was like that on the inside and there was a reptilian pilot and a human pilot, and that was kind of off to one side. And the craft flew, uh, you know, it didn't fly like it didn't fly like a frisbee. It flew with the top going going that way. It flew upward. You know, that was the direction. Yeah, that was the direction that it flew through space. And during when you looked out the window, all you saw was Starfield, which was beautiful, but they weren't moving. It wasn't wishing by like anything like Star Trek or anything. It just didn't move. It was really boring. So, and I was pacing the carpet the whole ride, the whole ride back, saying, "I'm gonna remember. I'm gonna remember. I'm, I'm not gonna forget this. I'm not gonna forget this," because I knew they were gonna, about to delete my memory. And every all of us did. There were probably uh, eight or nine people riding back to the moon to be processed. Do you have, do you have the photo or picture still on in the uh, in your uh, the Tim? That, that yeah, was ours. That to see if it looked anything like what he remembers. I think oh, you still you got it. The disc that you yeah. Had? Just curious. I think you got it in a file there somewhere. There it is. Oh wow. So the triangle. So I rode on a triangle craft that had. Go back to that one. So it had that kind of. Um, what do you call it? The vertical slits in it. It did. Okay. So the, uh, there was a triangular craft that had that kind of those maybe larger ones, but it had vertical slits in it. Um, on one, the first time that I went from Inyo Kern to the moon, there was a triangle craft that came down and got us, and it had slits like that. They, I think they were bigger though. Like this, the the individual. Yeah, I used to say it used to remind me of a turtle shell. Were much bigger, but it it wasn't a disc shape. It was a triangle shaped craft. But that is uh, that looks more like something we called a double disc. So there was a double disc that the series colony had that was their fastest ship, and the bottom of it protruded, and it was kind of had a cargo bay underneath of it, and it was we called it the double disc, and it had that kind of shape on the top of it, but it was black. Hmm. Yeah, we saw it wasn't didn't have that shiny look. It almost looked tarnished and beat up and old and like a turtle shell type of thing and it had these weird patterns on the outside and when i had the the depiction made of this um you know I, it's pretty darn close but the lip around the outside sticks out in that more than it would have it was more like just like a belt around it and uh but we didn't have any i don't remember anything on top i don't remember lights coming out the bottom i do remember that the craft itself illuminated and with 
had like a reddish sheen to it, but this was they one were of, pretty yeah. big too. From what yeah. I remember, this was yards. pretty good size. They like were a football yeah, field, a football. Well, uh, not uh, uh, two thirds of a of a football field around, yeah. but probably. Yeah, good size. Hey Tony, I have those pictures that you uh, sent me that you want me to show the uh, the people of some of the alien life. On Mars, I want to say this. I'm seeing some things in the chat. I, I just want to say that people, I think a lot of people don't realize that we're not being visited by one or two races. We're not being, it's not just one or two programs. There are literally billions of other species that visit us, and the craft and the level of technology are all like all very, very just as diverse. So that's why ufology looks like gibberish to a, to a, to a pure researcher. When they say, well, the, everybody else is describing this craft and you're describing this one. It's like, well, you know what? If you look out, there are trillions of worlds that have access to space flight and they can visit us and go home in the same day. So they, you know, they're not all craft or, you know, if you saw no two were alike for the rest of your every day for the rest of your life, that's a very real possibility. They're not all alike at all. I always used to believe they're kind of like how we have automobiles here on Earth. We exactly. have different vehicles different models for different purposes right but and a lot of different people driving them too so it we're all part of a bigger picture and we're just trying to put it together you know right so here's a picture that tony sent me okay that was one of the guys so he was from a heavy gravity planet and very strong and that was my security escort when i was in the base on the moon and when he took me from from area to area this guy was short he was probably three and a half four feet tall and he was from a heavy gravity planet, so he's very strong. So that was my in case I tried to run or uh, be combative or do something wrong. He was he was my security. And um, I mentioned to you backstage that he reminded me a lot of the blue beings that Whitley Strieber saw. That's right. So I originally thought he was blue, but the more I thought about it, I said no, he was a tan color. And I changed this. I did the hue on this one, um, but he was a tan but like a brownish tan color. Okay. And then we've got this one here. This was the mantid on my third combat mission, hike mission on the surface of Mars. And I had contact with this. This is an artist, uh, artofcon.com. He's a comic book artist in Turkey. He, he drew this picture in less than 10 minutes. That's how talented he was. I mean, I was, I couldn't describe it fast enough. And the, the tail end of the thorax, there were wings, and it was a more, little more detailed than that. But I didn't bother to tell him he was already done by the time I was still describing. It. The real important thing was that the antenna had, they looked like olives stacked. They were balls, and they would move independently. And uh, he kind of came up and questioned me and telepathically questioned me and scanned me for what to see what I was doing on the battlefield, what my, what my, my threat level, I guess, was. And I, I, I'm pretty sure I described it pretty good in my book. But um, he was about four and a half feet tall, five feet tall from the ground up and long. You know, I would guess he was about 100 pounds worth of weight, worth of mass. Wow. And he was very smart and articulate. He communicated telepathically and was very articulate. This was more like an animal. This was a much bigger bug like a spider and this was on the lunar base we were we did a combat test in a, like in an arena against one of these and blew it up and then these were also on mars i think this is this is what was pinning me down um when they but when they engaged us i was pinned down and i think this is one one of them so this was a bigger guy he was like the size of a motorcycle he was probably 400 pounds three four hundred pounds worth of bug and he was absolutely terrifying and behaved more like an animal, and he was not articulate and did not communicate. Um, your acquaintance uh, or friend, Penny, uh, stated in one of her interviews that those spiders were about 15 feet across. So I didn't really, so they could probably stretch out to that, you know, their their legs. They were very, they had a, they had a great, I remember one of the, one of the biggest things that I remember is that we were given a grenade that instantly detonated and we were trained to suicide and to kind of run up to it and blow it up. And I remember thinking to myself, there's no way I'm going to get close enough to it, to hurt it, that it would impale me before it, like it had a great reach to it. So she's probably not far off with that at all. That's, that's wow. totally something like, 
the legs were very long on it. I wonder if any of those spiders have ever gone off Mars uh, because when I was uh, young, I saw a very large black spider uh, in in my sister's room as I was walking down the hall. It scared me so bad I had to stay in my room until and scream until my parents came up to get me. When they came to get me, the spider was gone, but it was big. It was at least three and a half, four feet tall, maybe five feet across. So, right. Black. So. And what we yeah, saw, I, what, what we encountered too, the Berkshire's UFO case, for those that are in chat, we didn't see the typical gray type alien either. We, I showed uh, Tony before we started, but if you want to, that's pretty much what we saw, which that looked, looks like what are described as ant people that are actually right. have um, colonies inside the earth uh, currently. And I that's what we, we, were we were underground for sure. Yeah. So uh, other people are describing ant beings, ant people, uh, and yeah. even in folklore in, in there's a lot of uh, legend, you know, lore describing the same beings. Do you have Tim, do you have the full body version of that? Just no, so we can uh, take a look at that. No, you don't have it. I thought you did. No. I just okay. have the picture of the face. Right. Okay. But I had the long, thin, legs almost like bamboo type looking uh arms if you will and it was kind of it is squatted so it was uh not too far off from what you saw but um in that same family maybe it was certainly wasn't a gray and that kind of thing and the head was about the size of a football in in my experience there are many different versions of humans throughout the cosmos that are just like us but slightly yeah. different Sure. And there are many different versions of reptilians. Like it's hard to say that reptilians are all evil. They're not. They're it's just a life form and they're all over the place. And so some of them are behave a certain way and some of them behave sure. wonderfully. And there are answers. Every I met rat people, I met fish people, I met cat people. So versions of humanoids. And they had a they had a scale, they had an intelligence scale that they that would ping. And they, the Ceres Colony Corp, the Deutsch on Ceres Colony said that it could be a bucket of goo, uh, but if it talks 150,000 words, it's a person. So it could be a soup. And if it has 150,000 word vocabulary, then it qualified to be a person. And it alphabet added, soup. Yeah, alphabet <laughs> soup. It could be a, yeah, a blob. So they're people. Well, you know, at a certain level of intelligence, of consciousness, it's a person. It just it becomes uh, intelligent. Right. That's right. Yeah. Hey, Tony, can you tell us a little bit about how um, the ships travel through tears near Jupiter? So there are natural there are natural uh, phenomena, bubbles. There are bubbles of tears in space time that are near Jupiter because it's a failed star for whatever reason, either, you know, gravitational effects. I don't know what caused them, but there, there are several different kinds. They're temporal bubbles and there are actual bubbles that they use for portals. And the ship that I was on, the, the MVL, at the very end of my service, had three modes of transport. It had an A to B flight, like an anti-grav, that it could go just about light speed, a little bit under light speed from A to B. And then it had the ability to jump. And it would take two or three jumps to get across the distance of the galaxy. And it could go to other galaxies if it used one of these bubbles and did the same tech. Like it was a separate motor. And it had to enter at a certain speed and a certain angle and... It could go to another galaxy. I think the the number that we were told was that the one around Jupiter gave us access to like 18 other galaxies. And then from there, you could go to another similar phenomenon in one of those galaxies and go to 18 or 20 more. And that's how they went. And those were... Um, so when we jumped in the ship, the ship jump, you really... It was the same kind of experience. Like you got the tingly feeling, like a thousand needles... You know, poof, and then you'd get like a, a, a you know, like a, like as if as if your whole body fell asleep and is starting to get the blood back to it. If if you if you can imagine, yeah. I got, got, a, got, got a few seconds, done, seconds yeah. of that. But when we used the one to go to other galaxies, it, you, it was you were also very disoriented. It was more painful. It was very disorienting, and you became nauseous. A lot of people threw up, and so as a result, we had a ten minute wait time. The lights. It wasn't like red alert like in Star Trek, but we had a red light that came on like in Star Trek, you know, the, like the red alert. But that just meant that you couldn't do any work at your station because it was unfair for the score. Some people would recover quickly 
And some people were, were nauseous and dizzy for five or 10 minutes. So right. it was an unfair advantage and you would beat them in their productivity score. So everybody had to stay, take 10 minutes and not do anything. And I remember so, waiting for the yeah. light to shut off being upset about it. Like I just wanted to get back. It was boring. That's really interesting you said that because anyone who's listened to my talks before, um, we heard like a tapping sound. Um, you know, a lot of people say like an MRI machine, but this was like tiny, tiny stones hitting underneath our car, like a ting, 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 ting. And then all of a sudden we went out and when we came to, we were disoriented. We didn't come out of it like that. My grandmother came out of it first, then me, then my mother, and then my brother. We didn't come out of it all at the same time, all within about three minutes of each other, three to four minutes. And I always wondered, so many other people say, well, you know, we just instantly came out of this or it was it was instantaneous. When in fact, for us, it wasn't. We, you know, uh, my brother, when we came to or I came to, my brother's head was on my leg. He didn't come out of it till a good three to four minutes afterwards. So I find that really interesting that you said that. Different people had a different threshold. And we were rec we, we were told to always drink water. We had water fountains. We had water fountains in our near our workstation they were all over in the cargo bay area because after you did that they told you to drink water because your electrolytes were depleted and there was military definitely involved in your case right and there was in mine too yeah, oh, yeah. the military, military has access the levels of the military has access to this tech yeah okay but the, the thing i'm i'm kind of curious about is you you say military but does that also apply to alien species, do they have militaries? And if so, do they? Oh, absolutely. All right. And do they operate kind of like how we do, or is it totally different? I got to say that everything on everything you can imagine is, is so we did operate, we did go to, there were times, when, I didn't go on a lot of away missions. I was a cargo, I, I, I basically did data input. And when I was a cargo engineer, I got the mission briefing because I had a schedule to get my cargo out of the way for new cargo to come on. So that's why I was able to go to the mission briefings. And I had a schedule of our stops and they were not named. So we nobody was like, oh, we're going to Arcturus or we're going to the Pleiades. It didn't do that. Everything had a number. It was a number. Everywhere we ever went had a number to it. And um, but I had that, and there were times that I did do a handful of away missions for whatever reason. And some of them, one of them was a planet that was less advanced, kind of like us back in the 60s level technology. And it was a military uh, branch that we were dealing with covertly. And we snuck in and they had equipment that was a lot, it looked a lot like a Korean war era equipment, military equipment, but different. If you know, you get what I mean? Like it was, it was like that kind of technology but different like a different layout of the truck it was open uh no roof on it and uh there were other there were other places that we went that were very advanced that we were not allowed to go and there were places that had um stone structures with glass incorporated in them like imagine a pyramid with a corner of it as glass or wow. when uh, you were uh, you were uh, working with the cargo was it like cargo for food was it cargo for what kind of cargo are we talking everything. about? Everything. We did 55 gallon drums. We did cardboard boxes. We did crates. We had we had boxes with with, with you could scan them. They had radioactive isotopes that you, they didn't have any markings on them. There was a so, there was a radioactive marker that you could scan and it would tell you what was in it. So we did, did you everything. Uh, did you eat like regular food that, that was shipped there from we had a where? replicator on the ship? We had with that printed the food. We, it was like like a microwave. But you would put a, you would grab the bowl and put the top on it, put it in, and select. It had like six different meals, right. and they were all slimy. When it was, they were all super hot, boiling hot, and slimy. So it was like mashed potatoes. So and then they had, they had all the nutrients you needed. Yeah, you couldn't grab a coke. Uh, like right? No, no. So you could when we moved out of the colony. The colony had money, and it had there were real food, like restaurant imported food of actually real meat and vegetables and things that you could eat, you could get, but it, for me, it was expensive. So I never did that. And there were, there were bars, there was alcohol. You yeah. You had to pay for it. So the free food in the morning, there was a buffet that had like fake eggs. And then the ship had a replicator that we had to eat lunch out of. And then there was, uh, the mission briefings had like muffins and bagels and stuff. I used, that's what I used to eat for breakfast. I didn't eat the buffet in the morning because I went to the mission briefings. Um, and then it, in the night, it was back to the buffet. It was the same thing. So you weren't paid anything? 
it, towards the end, I did get a, like a profit sharing paycheck, but it was the equivalent of like 20 bucks a week, 20 to $40 a week, you know, in our money. If you think about the buying power of our money, yeah. I got in between 20 and 40 bucks a week. That's ridiculous. Family. Well, it let me buy train tickets and let me go and explore it. So they didn't care if you left and what, like as a slave, we, I was free to walk around. I just had to show up for work the next morning. And if I didn't show up on time to my post, they, they told us they'd put us to death. But if you didn't show up in time, then you'd be disciplined and you, you know, you, you would get in a lot of trouble. So we were free to go, but it was like five kilometer walk to the nearest town without a train pass. So, and then if you had no money, it's like, you just stayed there in the barracks. You didn't, you didn't explore. So when I was very lucky, like I said, that was a big, that was a big achievement for me to get a paycheck to where I could buy an all day pass and I could go to all the different towns and just walk around. Um, there was a lot to see. There were many different, there were many stops on the train route. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. We got questions in chat, but just like kind of blowing up here. I imagine. Let's see here. So was it busy? Like when you went into areas, I mean, was there a lot of other, yes. when you took these little trips, if you will, a lot of I other tried. humans walking around and so because I had a jumpsuit and a sl and a shock collar, I basically had a shock collar that tracked me and could shock me and put me back into that catatonic state. Like I said, that 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 was the programming fed into that program. Um, I try I I learned to avoid the public and I would go to places that were there less people because what happened was if somebody dropped something or there was a mess, then they would make me pick it up. So if you're in a store and somebody knocks a jar of mayonnaise and it breaks on the floor and I was standing there, even the store clerk, even the kid that worked in the store would say, you clean that up. And I had to do it. I was a slave. I was slave labor. So I had no rights. I didn't have rights. So I got abused. And so there were times when I didn't even like being on the train. I got, you know, many, many times I would get on the train and sit down and it would fill up and people would go, you stand up over there, give me your seat. And I had to do it. And it, so it was humiliating. Sure. And I, so I avoided, I did go to the city. Whenever they built something new, I would hear people like, you got to go there and check this out. And this is a new, they got a new thing there. And uh, I'm just reading that. Um, but I would go do that, but I didn't spend a lot of time in, in the pub, the really busy areas for that reason. Yeah. To experience something so extraordinary and then have to pick up somebody else's mayonnaise. It's like, <laughs> well, it was humiliating. You know what Jesus I mean? It, it, it wasn't extraordinary to me at the time. So space flight space is its own thing. So I would say yeah. this, I would say that the experience of going into deep space is the experience of going to deep space. It's always going to be a uh, very um, moving experience, no matter what context you're there. It's something that your soul we're meant to do. And it's a very moving experience. And I would say that, but I wasn't, you know, we weren't, it wasn't a big deal to me the same way that if you went back into the 1800s tomorrow and people would be blown away because you have a car and a microwave and a cell phone, you, it's not a big deal to you. You, you don't know how to build a car or a microwave or a cell phone. You, you know, you get what I'm saying? Like you live in a, we live in a very high tech environment right now compared to most of history. But it's not impressive to you because you just want more tech. Well, it, was the, it was the exact same when we were there. You're accustomed to it. That's exactly right. There's a I question did. for you. Oh, there's a good one. You were in love, I right? I yeah. did. I had, a, I had a couple of relationships. I had a few. Um, you know, I had been sexually abused early on in my time. Uh, you know, I was a slave. And I eventually did have a relationship. I was head over heels in love. Uh, and um, cut off from her at the very end. It's kind of like... Uh, you know, people who read the book have a hard time. It's very, it's very, um, it's very uncensored and and traumatic. A lot of people read the book and really don't believe, can't believe it's shocking. And I always say, well, you know, it got a little bit better at the end. You know, the end there were some bad things, but I did, uh, you know, I did fall in love and I had a girlfriend for a while and I had another relationship at the end. There's the book. Oh, and. Uh, it did good. So the book is actually still selling pretty good. And it was number one for like the first six weeks. And it popped into number one a couple of weeks ago again, but uh, it's still selling. So, and I'm working hard on the second book. Um, I'm looking for, like I said, the release date on the second book is April of 23. So 
few months from now, we're, I'm working hard on it. The second book is going to be um, uh, the second book's got a little bit more woo to it. So put it that way. I'll just leave it like that. Now, series Colony Cavalier is available on Amazon, correct? That's right. And you can get to it off my website, TonyRodrigues.com. So it has a link to it. Good. So if you're interested in the chat room or watching online for one of his books, pick it up. It's sure to uh, inspire you and show you what this man has suffered and gone through and is willing to share on this channel. So, uh, and many others. Um, I've heard that you've done over about 250 or more interviews since your book came out. Well, it's all total. So the book came out in January, um, January 1st. We, we uploaded it on, on New Year's, uh, you know, when, right when we finished it. It was like at the end, we were like, we're going to finish at the end of the year. So it hit Amazon January 1st of this year. And I've done, I don't know, maybe 70 uh, interviews since then. But I've over, over since I came public with my first interview, I've done over 300 interviews. Wow. Um, and many of them two hours. So it was really, that was the other thing that really kind of motivated, because I could still be working on the book. I, I'll be clear that there's not everything included in the book. I, you know, right. I had, I really had to barnstorm because what happened was out of those hundreds of interviews, they were getting deleted. And I'd go back and I, I thought that that was kind of like, I would do an interview, a show like this, and that'd be my legacy. So if I died, at least my story is out there. I didn't want to take it to the grave. And what I realized is that all of the electric medium can be deleted uh, you know, by a keystroke. and But a right. book on somebody's shelf cannot. And much harder once there's... So it really motivated me to finish the book. And it was like, I got to do it now or never. And I kind of just... I worked on the book for six years. And so it was super disappointing when people say, I read your book in one day. <laughs> <laughs> but, Unless um, it was so right, right? Yeah. A lot of people so read captivating, it. so captivating, they couldn't put it down, you know? A lot of people read it. It's a fast read. I've been working on mine for 15 years. I, you know, it's yeah, hard. It's like a painting. You can keep doing it. At a certain point, you got to say, you got to get your book out, man. And then yeah. save it for book two. You know, you can do, up, do the patch on book two. But I say, you know, wrap it up and get it out there because you're you're just um, selling yourself short right now by not getting it out there. Tomorrow's never promised. So you got to get your book done. That's true. Right. They say tomorrow's not a day, but we may not have it. That's right. Here's his book, a book that will mark our times. Series Colony Cavalier, available on Amazon and on TonyRodrigues.com. And um, the other thing about the book was that it's nice to say, I wrote a book about it, just go read it. <laughs> Instead of telling the whole thing, to, you know what I mean? Like telling the whole right. thing like over and over again. Right. It's really nice to say that, you know, it's in the book. Yeah, I'm definitely going to read it. I got to say that Jackie Kenner, who helped me with the book, the edit, was really the secret sauce to it, to be to it being a fast read. She's she's somebody that cuts out a lot of the description. She's like, you're wasting my time. I'm boring me to sleep. Are you gonna, when are you going to get to the point? And so she really went back and tweaked the book. And that's why it's that's why people can't put it down is because it's it's one after another of, of points instead of beating getting to the point. And it's her style. It was Jackie that did that totally in the editing process. She made she really polished it for me. Um, I could have never done it by myself. I heard you also kind of had a, a different type of style in regards to spacing. That's right. Well, that's how I type. So I've always been like that. All my emails I put. I can't. I get lost if I if it's all in one big car paragraph. Like it's hard for me to get to start here and then go back to here. I get lost and I have to hold my finger there. It's just. It's, it makes it tough for me to read. So I put spaces at the end of my paragraph. I put an entire line there. So it stretched it out. Um, but it turns out it's a lot faster to read. It's a lot easier on the eyes. And so that's just how I write. That's how I write my emails. If you look in the book and you see the big paragraphs, those that's Jackie. And if you look at the ones that are spaced, that's me. Sure. I, I think on the second book, she's helping me with the second book. And she's adopted my style. So, so you can't tell if it's her or not. So... Um, so I can't say that for the second book, but that was the case in the first book. Well, thanks goes out to Jackie for helping me yeah. out. She's awesome. She's an awesome person. She's a, the smartest person I ever met. Just absolutely freakishly brilliant. Well, I've met a few people like that. Hmm. Tom? Yeah. No, I just, uh, I'm actually kind of uh, shocked. I mean, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a lot to, 
to digest, you know, it's one heck of a, you know, an interview and, um, you know, but uh, hats off to you, man. And, uh, you know, we, like I said, we're holding a UFO expo. So maybe uh, after hey, the show, we'll see if you want to zoom in or something. I would love to uh, yeah. keep me posted. You know, it's just, just uh, let me know. I, 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 I'm committed to the mission. I think you know, when I got all my memories back, I thought yeah. to myself, what, do, what, what do I do with this? Right. Right. And so I thought, don't say a word. And that just haunted me. And I thought, man, I'm going to die. And on my deathbed go, wait, I was in space and a lot of sense that, you know what I mean? Like and right. the more I thought about it, like people need to know that this is reality, that this is the reality. Our, our reality is not BMWs and shopping malls. That's BS. Our reality yeah. is that we're part of a bigger galactic, yeah, yeah, of the universe is accessible and there's life out there and there's 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 spirituality to um to be ascended to ascend to. There's a spirituality, there's a better thing to to achieve. And you turn it into something positive, right? I mean, you know, you can sit there and like us, we could have sat there and, and you know, just fought it and been miserable their whole life or we can look at the positive front look what look what you went through look what you mean it was it sucked in a lot of ways but you know you've done a lot more than anyone else right i mean who else can say that that really happened to them you know that they experienced so many unique things and same with us you know we saw things that were frightening we experienced a lot of ridicule and we still do but it's, it's we're important still who we are you know and we're going to be true to ourselves and and we're going to stand for what you know, stand up for ourselves and believe in ourselves, and you're doing the same thing. So, I took by my lumps way, along the way, but I've it's I've met a lot of great people too. So I yeah, exactly. I, by the way, Tony, I'm I'm uh, along with several professional uh, consultants and panelists are starting a website for experiencers called the Experiencers Database. So when it gets up and running, check us out. Come on over because you are an experiencer first and foremost, and I'd like to have you on there. I think that's beautiful, and there are other people kicking around the idea. So what we're getting is a lot of fragmentation in the ufology right now. There are people coming forward saying that, you know, I represent this and I represent that, and they're butting heads. So we, what we really want to do is figure out a way to have unity for people because right, the audience exactly. is starting to get so saturated with conflicting reports that they're just throwing up their hands and going away. We need to... We need to penetrate to the to the normal community the people need to know this people need to have disclosure and it doesn't right. help for all these conflicting stories so a web a database like that's very important we're talking we're kicking around an idea of having like giving everybody five minutes inviting everybody to come on and do a show give them five minutes tell us how you got your info uh what if your what your evidence is and where you're going with it and just kind of let right. everybody sort it out because there's so many conflicting and there are let's face it there are legitimate disinfo agents that are in the community oh, there are cia assets that are out here that are it's psyop and they're right. what they're doing is dissipating the information so instead of fighting the one point of data they're surrounding it with a thousand points of crap data see so that's, that's one of the on. things that's one of the things we want to make sure of we actually have an engineer that's going to encrypt the site so there's no back door so that uh we don't become like MUFON and have the CIA in our back door. We want to make sure that it's totally encrypted so that when people come on, we give them a pseudonym, if they, a pseudonym name, if they request to be completely anonymous, but they'll still be able to operate within the, in the parameters of the site. I think that's very important. Uh, the site is very important. And, uh, People, you know, like I said, they're saturating it with like, it's just like if you Google and try to look for a picture of a UFO, you're going to get 50,000 fakes. And there are real pictures. There are real pictures. Right. But they're buried behind the 50,000 fake pictures. So by the time you spend a week to find it and see one, you go, maybe it is, maybe not, I don't know. And that's, so they don't bur worry about if you put a real picture up there because right. they're just going to bury it. And that's what's happening to our testimonies right now. It's very dangerous. And it's right. very, it's very counterproductive because... These testimonies are, are important. Tom, you know, you know exactly what I mean. These this is important. People need to know this. People need to know what reality is really is. Oh yeah. Right. You, know, you know, it's funny me too, too, because you know, like you said, there's so much nonsense going around, there's so much intertwined and everything that no one knows what where, you know, who's legit, what's really happening, and they don't know, you know, where to hang their hat. And um, so that's one of the reasons I really like doing the show with, with uh 
Tim here because uh, I get to talk to everyone. I get a feel for everybody. And uh, there are some things that, uh, that I don't mention like you when you're interviewing or talking to somebody and all of a sudden they hit on something that you've never mentioned before. And then, you know, but That's when right. you share everything and everything's out there, you're like, Oh, you know, everyone's jumping on the bandwagon or you, you, you right. know, it's hard to make exactly. sense of who's telling you the truth. And, and, um, but, uh, you know, those I think who've had experience can tell what somebody else has. And, um, and for that too, you know, I want to thank you for coming on too, because this can't be yes. easy. I mean, you, 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 you throw it all out there like I do. Yes, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, take it. I got to put the good with the bad. And that's because it's all evidence. And, and yeah. you know, it's, I should have made a pseudonym. I My very first interview, they said, do you want to make a name? Like, a, you want to make like an alias, you know? And I try, I couldn't think of any. I actually took like five minutes and thought like, Johnny. Uh, you know, like I couldn't. And I thought, man, I'll get called it for the rest of my life or whatever. I don't. I said, just I'll just run with Tony. It's my name. Yeah. And uh, I kind of some you know on a slight level kind of regret that <laughs> yeah but it is what it is man you know what i mean i i i ain't lying and so i'm sticking to it you know yeah. it's just it's that there simple. you go yeah if you there if you, you can't accept it that's not my problem right and well the other thing right. is that time and i always said people came up with stories like what do you, how do you know these memories aren't implants and i said well i don't but time is told time has time has supported me time hasn't ripped me apart over the course of the last six years seven going on seven years now it keeps getting supported. Keep things keep churning up that support my, uh, that support my testimony, and, and not vice versa. And other people have had the the absolute the opposite happen. They've had their testimony dashed to pieces over time. So time is the greatest lie detector, and I put my faith in it. For all the other people that are coming forward, just give it time, and it'll pan out or it won't. Right. right. That's another thing Thank too. You. When you have something like this, and you're that forward with it, you're that. You know, matter of fact, I mean, it, it helps open doors for other people because, you know, it's uh, they realize they're not alone. It's great to see Beth in the chat. She's a friend of mine and an avid uh, researcher and a con and a, she's she, has a great deal of, <laughs> she has a great deal of experiences herself. Beth is an amazing person. I'm happy, uh, proud to call her my friend. Thank you, Beth. Anyways, any last comments, Tom? I'm just looking over the chat right here real quick. I um, was too. Yeah. Make sure we don't leave anybody out. Um, oh, wait anything, here. Tony, anything you want to? Oh, uh, this is a good question. So Dr. Sala really, I worked with Dr. Sala early on and he put me through the ringer, man. Like he really, he really cross-examined me and he was very classy about it. And he put, so when he has a stamp on other people, I, I trust him. I, I trust ExoPolitics. So they've gotten a lot of flack lately. There's a lot of things like he's, you know, um, but I trust Dr. Sella. I think he's, I think he's onto something. I think he's one of the best researchers there is. And JP's information is very, very important. I think JP's the real deal. And um, uh, the thing is, I don't want to talk too much about him. He's he's active contactee and everything. So I'll zip my lip on JP, but I think he's a hero. And uh, I think Dr. Sal is a great doing great work. So I support those guys, and I'm happy to be included on that. I'll be coming up. I'm on an I'm on an upcoming episode of ExoPolitics as well, and I'm very proud of that. That's actually where I found you first, Tony. Was over on uh, Dr. Sal's site. I watched hmm. that interview, and I was like, "Oh, I gotta have him on my show because." I wanted him to tell his story to all our viewers because they're very interested in that. And I want people to know that they're not seeing the real world here on Earth. We well, are, and a lot of people know that. They just don't know what they're not seeing, right? Yeah, it's like there is so much they're not seeing. And if a shred of anything you've said is 100% fact, oh, my God right that's the point that's the yeah. whole point and it, um i do believe that what you're saying you experience is real so we'll go from there and i want to um, thank you tony okay thanks for having for coming me coming on the channel it's been very interesting and very inspiring i'd like to have you on again to where maybe we can go a little deeper or have a little more conversation with uh, maybe an added 
panelist that you might want to bring on with you. Maybe we can get Penny on here with you. Sure. Um, I've done shows with Penny before and she's, she's, she takes right over. She's got a lot of info. She can go for days. Um, <laughs> you guys just keep me in the loop, man. You got me on email. I would love to work, collaborate with you guys in the future. You got your, your, um, your conference thing coming yeah, up. I'd yeah. love to, I'd right? love to help you guys out any way I can. Like I oh, said, just hang on when we get off air for a minute. Okay, yeah, we all yeah, should yeah. work together here. This is important. Yeah, the, the entire community, bringing people even together. on both sides, needs to work together. We need to get to the mainstream, and yeah. we need to do this by all being on the same page. So, right. yeah. exactly, I agree a hundred percent. Oops. Sorry. Oh wow! <laughs> there, there it is. That was, a, that was a fast flash. What happened there? Okay. Well, anyways, I want to say thank you to everyone who watched online, and thank you to everyone who participated in the chat. Also, Thanks, thank you to my flock is everywhere, Sarah, for the super stickers, and to Beth for coming on and supporting your friend, Tony. I really appreciate that. And from all of us here, I got to find it now. Hold on. <laughs> the X. The here it is. From everyone on the panel, we want to say good night. Good night.